Today we are visiting Norris Clark, one of the U.S.'s finest metaphysicians, to find out more about his own life as a philosopher and his thoughts on the possibility of a creative retrieval of Thomism. How did you get started in philosophy? It began really when I, uh, when I was asked to go over and do my philosophy as a young Jesuit in the island of Jersey in the English Channel. That was an entirely French house. And um, four of us went over there, the first ones from the New York province to go to the island of Jersey. When we got there, they asked us why we had come there. And we said, well, we were told uh, we were supposed to be studying classics and we were told that uh, we came to study under the famous Father So-and-so, a famous uh, expert in classics. So they looked at each other and said, he's been dead 25 years, which meant that we were not up on developments exactly in, in our province overseas. But anyway, so we happily dropped classics and went into philosophy. And uh, it was a wonderful house, an international house with a wonderful um, faculty. And uh, I had Father Andre Mark, M-A-R-C, who was a young, brilliant young Thomist metaphysician, fairly young, and a powerful mind. And he took us and uh, led us through the, the very beginning, making a judgment, all the way through the entire development of metaphysics, just unfolding like peeling an onion, so to speak all the richness contained at the beginning. And it was a wonderful experience. My mind just opened and blossomed like a flower under that tremendous experience. So that was, um, uh, that together with reading two books, which um, gave me my sea legs as a philosopher. One of them was Marischal's great uh, Point de départ de la métaphysique, the point of departure of metaphysics, his five volume in four volumes then, History of Philosophy from the point of view of Thomism, and then ending up finally with, uh, uh, well, it was all the way up to, I guess, Hegel. Um, but St. Thomas was the central focus, and the famous fifth K.A. was his own exposition of St. Thomas, um, following somewhat the Kantian uh, method of the transcendental analysis of the conditions of knowing. So we put the history of philosophy in there, the entire history of philosophy from the central point of view of Thomistic metaphysics. That was an extraordinary experience. I've since not exactly a fully card-carrying member of the transcendental Thomist school for various reasons, but the, the central thing was the dynamism of the human spirit and then the central Thomistic viewpoint. And that, to, to re I sat down and read all the four volumes published then and made notes on them. And it was a tremendous experience sort of self-education along with, the, uh, with, with my Thomas teachers there. And in the second book, which was a contraband book at the time, that was Maurice Blondel's L'Action, 1893 version. It was a powerful dynamic one, taking uh, what Marischal did with the dynamism of the human intelligence, Blondel did with the dynamism of the will. That if you will anything, you're committed to will all the way implicitly the infinite good, God. And you can't not will, because not to will is already to will not to will. So we're committed. You can't help not willing. It's too late. You're thrown into the world of uh, um, uh, of reality there. Um, so uh, um, at that time, he was, he was being strongly attacked by Father Garrigou Lagrange, the great watchdog of orthodoxy, the Dominican. And he claimed it was, um, it was dangerous, anti-intellectual, and was under a cloud, should be banned, and that sort of thing. So Blondel, who was very devoted to the church, um, said he would do a re-edition, and he wouldn't allow a republication of, his, of that book until he had done the revision, which took place 20 years later and was not nearly as good. But I got the original, but it was banned, uh, considered not safe reading for the young Jesuits, so it was banned, and there was no Xerox things in those days. So a group of scholastics had typed, typed it out 
in Paris, typed out that whole book, and then brought it back secretly as contraband. And when you were accepted into the club of real philosophers in the third or fourth year, the third year, they would lend it to you for two weeks. You had to hide it under your mattress because the minister was very fussy, would go around checking, did you have any prohibited books? So I had, I, I had it for two weeks and put it under my mattress and read it with tremendous uh, to will anything is implicitly to go all the way to willing the infinite, which is, now that set me up, the dynamism of the mind and the dynamism of the will and this structure of participation. It just, I sort of felt I had gotten a hold of the basic meaning and structure of the universe, and that was tremendous. So from then on, I felt <clears throat> the end of my third year that I still a lot that I didn't know, but I felt that I was a philosopher now my own sea legs and could talk to anybody else in the world. A lot, a lot I didn't know, sure, but that I now was a philosopher, had a viewpoint on the universe, and that was a tremendous experience. So I'm very grateful for that. I didn't pick up all the later things about the Neoplatonism and even the participation that much, but I did get that basic Thomistic vision and the dynamism of intellect and will is underlying all of philosophy and spirituality and everything. So that was a tremendously rich experience. And the young French scholastics uh, were so much more um, um, educated than, than ourselves at the same time. They had read so much more, you know, very sophisticated culture they had. So we used to go out together and sit on the, um, on the seashore, it was this island of Jersey. We'd sit on the rocks by the seashore and read Homer in Greek and various other things, but the Palophlos Boyo Thalassae, you could just hear the sea in the, in the Homer and uh, read various things. And they were so good at um, talking about their own inner spiritual and uh, spiritual experience, very good at talking about deep things. Americans are shy at talking about deep personal things, but not the French. They had great gift for doing diaries. So being able to speak about about spiritual and intellectual things fully and without any kind of embarrassment was just wonderful. So my mind expanded there and I became really very good friends with them, perhaps better than most people back here that time. So that was, that was a wonderful period. Did you have any early experiences that predisposed you for philosophy? I loved high places. I would climb any tree that I could find as high as I could. And then when I got, got bigger, I would climb up the pillars of the George Washington Bridge, as I told you, told you before, 300 feet up, and then go over to the, the other side of the Hudson and climb up the Palisades to get the highest viewpoint I could find. And that's uh, a kind of, a, um, kind of an archetype, I guess, of when you're up high, you can see how everything fits together, rivers and things like that and valleys, and it's a kind of symbol of seeing how the universe fits together. So to see things from a high place, to see them coming together in some kind of unity or pattern, and that's a model. So I always um, had a used to think about uh, being and that kind of thing, but I didn't have any kind of systematic. And then a young um, Jesuit who went crazy slightly afterwards, there was too much insulin and for diabetes, he uh, took a group of us and gave us a tremendous opening to spiritual things, the doctrine of the mystical body and all that. So I had had a, an opening at the beginning down two years at Georgetown. And then my tree climbing and um, rock climbing expeditions. But this, that, that was sort of a practical, physical kind of metaphysics uh, from a high place. And now I got into the uh, strictly intellectual kind of thing. Tell us about your first article the one about the Neoplatonic elements in St. Thomas. That wasn't my first, my first article was, has never been reprinted, what is really real? <laughs> that became quite, uh, quite celebrated in a sense because it was attacking the, uh, the even in the Thomistic textbooks, the tradition had gotten in, I think from contamination with uh, Scotism and various other things, that real being was divided into two classes, actual and possible. So the possibles were one branch of real being. Uh, and uh, I thought that when I got into the existential Thomism, it was clear to me that 
could not be at all St. Thomas. It only a being with an act of existence was real being. The possibles were not real being at all. So I wrote this article uh, attacking this big tradition and um, uh, that made quite a stir and upset some people because even many of the traditional textbooks would have this division. Thomistic textbooks in Latin and uh, you know, by Thomas, they had this division of, of real being, that not at all St. Thomas. It came later with Scotus and Suarez and people like that, but it had contaminated. So that was a kind of a famous one, but it was a long one and has never gotten reprinted. Maybe sometime it might. But this other one you mentioned is what I'm best known for, I guess. Um, that came not when I was over uh, in the island of Jersey studying philosophy for the first time. It didn't come there. Uh, we were not quite, we were into the existential Thomism, but not quite the um, Neoplatonic and participation. It was more um, modern Thomists. But uh, when I got to Louvain to study, um, that's where I discovered, well, one of the reasons was, was that the books were not out yet. All this burst out in different authors writing around the year 1939. And uh, without uh, connection with each other because of the war coming up, their books during the war did not get around. Um, those didn't really get around until after the war. So those books of uh, um, Father Geiger on participation in St. Thomas, uh, Fabro, Cornelio Fabro in Italian on participation, and De Finance. Those three books were all in the same line, but they just came out around 1939, got lost in the war, and only got known afterwards. So I picked up that whole new development of the um, Neoplatonic element in St. Thomas. I picked that up in Louvain when I went there to do my PhD in 1947. I did that 1947 to 49. Um, that's where I picked that up. That was all moving around then. So the combination of the existential Thomism of Gilles saw plus this new development gave me the uh, full rich St. Thomas, I think. So when I was over there in, uh, in, in, in Europe in 1947, it was in the middle of all the, the existentialism, Jean-Paul Sartre and all that, and the phenomenology. So I soaked up that existential phenomenology for a couple of months and then went into St. Thomas to try and put it together. What brought about the decline of Thomism at the time of the Second Vatican Council? It, it was a rather dramatic change when, when, when I came back in uh, 1950 and, and then for about 10 years, Thomism was really what they called the um, Thomistic Triumphalism. That was the triumphal period of all the American Catholic philosophical and all the Thomism was riding high with the journals and uh, um, Gilson was up in Toronto. That was the Thomistic triumphalism. And um, uh, Philip Gleason from Notre Dame has tried to write up some of that history that they had a great idea of unifying all of Catholic culture around Thomistic philosophy, all of Catholic culture. And even in um, science and sociology, all of that to make this the, the uh, great unifying thing that everybody would accept. Uh, but um, um, shortly after that, the idea of one common philosophy, and then it became a kind of ideology uh, needed to preserve the culture. And then instead of being for its own sake, it became the connected, we've got to hold on to this to preserve the unity of culture. And that's turning it, as they say, into an ideology as a cultural defense. And then, it, then that's, that's always dangerous. So um, anyway, what happened was that with all the um, the uh, bursting out of novelty and the Second Vatican Council and everything and the general um, blowing off of the lid of respect for authority all during the 60s and 70s. Um, it's not this, this notion of a, 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 an imposed orthodoxy of philosophy as well as theology just, uh, just was too much for the young people. So they, they didn't refute St. Thomas. They just quietly moved away into phenomenology and other things. They, they never refuted St. Thomas. They simply shifted their interest and just quietly dropped him. 
And it was partly the fault of the church making him the, not just the common doctor, but the required for all the philosophy and theology and, and holding on to this, then you were part of the Catholic culture, too identified it with Catholic culture, and um, it became a straitjacket. So the revolt against authority and all that just made these, these young people, if we're throwing over, if we're opening to the, to the new modern world, then we should open to the modern world of philosophy too. But strangely, they never examined St. Thomas carefully, the new generation, and refuted him, just moved away, lost interest. So they moved into phenomenology was the principal thing they moved into. And some into Hegel, I guess, but principally phenomenology. So a massive movement of the young people out of Thomism into these new trends and uh, against the old textbook orthodoxy of St. Thomas. That was what happened. It was a rapid decline. But um, um, the good things in St. Thomas got lost along with the... Uh, um, the ideology and the rigid textbooks and so on, a great deal got lost. What was the impact of the decline of Thomism on Catholic theology? I think it had a uh, rather dramatic impact on Catholic theology. They're beginning to realize now, as Michael Novak once said, all of the great so-called liberal theologians, even who got in trouble uh, around the time of the Vatican Council, all the new things, Skillebakes and all those people, um, de Lubac and everybody, even though they were getting into trouble, all those great theologians, innovative ones, were all trained in Thomism earlier. Now, of those after that who were not trained in Thomism, it's not clear that we've produced any really great theologians. So the, the great innovative theologians, even who got in trouble, were all trained in the old Thomism. And those who were not, who were, who were so-called liberated from Thomism, it's not clear that we've yet produced any great theologians, uh, whether um, unorthodox or orthodox, really great theologians. So there's been a great decline in the, in the strength and vigor, uh, systematic vigor of Catholic theology. And, um, uh, you know, there are many theologians, uh, they say they have as somebody said, they have stayed away from metaphysics as from a leper, try to get away from all that. But as a result, they get very foggy kinds of theories about the Trinity and so on, like a uh, leading book, Catherine Lacuna's book on the Trinity, which is a, otherwise a good book, and she got prizes for it, and she's a wonderful, wonderful woman, wonderful Catholic scholar. In her book on the Trinity, she says, she warns theologians that they must remember all of their fundamental concepts are metaphorical. Now, if everything you say about God is metaphorical, there's nothing literally true anymore. You can't even say that um, if everything is metaphorical, you're endlessly chasing, because metaphor means it's like something else, and that's like something else, and like something else. So you never have a literally true statement about God even that God is intelligent, God is wise and good. If those are all metaphors, what is? And then he, how about being? If that's a metaphor that God is, what is it like? Something else that's not being. So that's an impossible situation. That's not thought through clearly, you know, philosophically, whatever the, the um, orthodoxy of it. It's just not thought through, but that can, uh, that can, uh, can go along and uh, so uh, I think the theology has been seriously weakened because of the lack of a firm, a, uh, a clear metaphysics that knows about causality and all that kind of thing. So I think there's been a very serious weakening. But the remarkable thing is that the creative theologians, even who got into trouble, went too far, they were all trained on the, the old strong Thomism and then they branched out creatively but those who were liberated don't seem to have gone much of anywhere except to get all kinds of, of sort of somewhat fluffy. Now that's a, bit, that's a bit strong. There are many, a number of good theologians, but not the really great theologians, strange to say. So that the liberation didn't seem to give them wings to fly that much. How can we recover the riches of Thomism today if it's not being taught? I think what's happening now is that um, 
in this somewhat of a vacuum of uh, solid philosophical theory, uh, what's coming, what's happening is that the Thomistic metaphysics and philosophy is coming back through the door of ethics. People like Alastair MacIntyre, who's, um, uh, as you know, has, be, has become a convert to, to Catholicism finally, and is, has attacked the, uh, all the modern analytic ethics and has put out his own books, and finally one on three ways of doing ethics, Kant and Aristotle, and where, where he's opting for St. Thomas as the best way to do it. He's been, he, 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 he went over two years ago to, to England to study St. Thomas during the summer with, with his old classmate Herbert McCabe, the, the Blackfriar Dominican. So he studied St. Thomas and he's bringing it back through ethics. So a lot of people are slowly coming to the metaphysics the, of human nature and of being through ethics because they, they see the lack of. So I think it's going to be a slow, steady kind of presence. There are young Thomas slowly coming out. It's a steady presence now, um, not dying, and slowly getting perhaps more through ethics. That's how, it's, that's how it's coming back. But it certainly will not be the dominant, the dominant strain, in, and over in Europe, it's certainly not the dominant strain in the Catholic, um, Catholic, Catholic University, at least, at least in France, anyway. So the, in the seminaries, it's stronger here in the seminaries, still, the Thomism. It's about the only place, but it, it's coming back slowly through ethics, to, to be the foundation of ethics. How could a creative retrieval of Thomism take place? St. Thomas himself um, is, a, is difficult to get into by yourself because of the heavy technical uh, armature of terminology and so on that he took over from Aristotle that used to be coin of the realm for all the um, Catholic thinkers. Um, uh, that it's hard, it takes about 10 years to get through, to get really at home in St. Thomas. What we need now is to have some way of um, uh, streamlining St. Thomas, getting his great seminal ideas, which, so then putting them across so people can understand them, uh, easily see their relevance to their lives without having to go through a whole long technical training, a whole jargon as they call it, uh, like Heidegger, the, uh, it was pretty impossible too. St. Thomas isn't nearly as bad as that, he's much clearer, but, but um, uh, what is needed is to get, get the rich seminal ideas of St. Thomas out of that technical structure that is like a, an armor and get them more easily accessible. That's what, what, what I call creative retrieval of the thought of St. Thomas, the great seminal ideas. That's what, but that doing that upsets some of the Thomistic scholars because it doesn't seem to be you know, exactly how St. Thomas was putting it. And it's, but I think that's, that's important. To take, you're taking a risk whenever you re-express the thought of an older thinker in your own terms, in more modern terms. You're taking a risk. But without that, the seed can't take root in new soil. It's just restricted to a smaller group. But I think the ideas are, uh, for example, when I was teaching out at Santa Clara, I just had a 10-week course on St. Thomas for undergraduates. And I just hit the great seminal ideas. And these students were amazed. And they said, where has this man been? Nobody ever gives us any uh, integrating visions like this. One modern philosopher tells us you can't know that. Another says you can't know this. Nobody tells us what we can know and no integrating visions. Where has this man been? But I didn't get to all the technical. I, you, you can streamline it if you really understand something. You know, great uh, experts on things have claimed that if you really understand any subject, you can teach it to a young person. One man took the challenge of teaching set theory and mathematics to a 12-year-old uh, boy. They said, you can't do it. He showed how you can do it. If you really understand it, you can put it simply and it can take root. So that's what needs to be done, I think. It's a risk to, to streamline, but uh, I think it's worth it and it's very important to get those ideas to take root. Like my most recent book, Person and Being, has been uh, republished in the Philippines with a commentary applying it to ecology and has been mandated by the Philippine government as required reading for all Filipino students in higher education studying philosophical anthropology in order to get them responsible 
for their environment before it's, it's too late. Uh, but that's precisely that creative retrieval kind of work that some Thomists have thought was going to not sticking to St. Thomas enough and so on. So I think it's, they're, the ideas are very fertile, but they have to be, have to be put in more streamlined uh, form and just the great seminal ideas without all the armature. It's dangerous but necessary. People are doing that all the time with Plato. They've done it for many, many centuries. We have to do it with St. Thomas too. Are you optimistic about the future of Thomism? I'm um, moderately optimistic in that because of its strength, it'll be a steady, steady, quiet influence. Many places now are willing to hire one Thomist, to have a representative Thomist. It won't be dominant, but I think it'll continue as a quiet thing. And um, maybe if the theologians settle down, they might go back to uh, something like that. But uh, I think of it as a quiet, steady influence. And as we get more and more vacuum of um, serious thinking in the rest of the culture, that there may be such a need to, to, to getting a more, more solid, rich, and a philosophical backing that they, it, it might become more popular again. The Wall Street Journal just had a uh, astonishing editorial, which you may or may not have seen, came out on the moral chaos in, in the U.S. that nobody knows. So that, that kind of vacuum of meaning and all that may really draw people back to something like that. But I don't look for that immediately. But a steady presence, uh, fruitful presence. What are some of the areas in which Thomism could make a real contribution? I think uh, one is the philosophy of the person, a powerful notion of the person as self-possessing, uh, master of one's dominus sui, self-possessing and self-communicating and self-transcending, that notion of the person. And then the, um, the, the notion of the, an integrating vision of the whole universe as a vast community of beings all participating from a source in God, the notion of the universe as a community where nobody can really be alienated because we're, we're in a community, a kind of natural, co-natural friendship, as St. Thomas says, with all beings. We belong. To be is to belong to a community, for St. Thomas. That notion of, instead of being isolated in a meaningless universe, we're part of a great meaningful a community of existence coming from God. That, that vision of being as a um, great unified community and the role of the person in it, I think, are very important. The next area would be in, in ethics, the natural law morality. And um, the third area, I think, would be something that is coming up now. There was an article done by a, somebody who claimed he was inspired by my metaphysics. An article came out in the International Philosophical Quarterly last, um, last September on St. Thomas's uh, substantial form and modern science, and uh, showing how the modern science is coming back now to a notion of wholes, of wholes which are not just the sum of its parts, but a whole which exercises causal influence on the parts below it, which is a new thing in science. It was always reductionism. You analyze the parts, and the parts influence the whole, and that's it. But now there's a two-way influence, the parts influencing the whole and the whole as a causal unity influencing and controlling its parts. Now the notion of a whole as having a causal force is practically identical with the Thomistic substantial form. So that's, there's a need in that called the principle of wholeness coming back into science, biology and then elsewhere. So in that area there, which is just sort of beginning, uh, there's an area there for trying to understand that principle of wholeness in science, which uh, St. Thomas had a notion of a substantial form, which is the active unity of, 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 of the whole um, composite parts in a uh, single being, especially in biology, but even in atoms and molecules. The whole uh, being a causal influence. Now that's something that got knocked out by the reductionism, the atomism and reductionism that's been common to science ever since Descartes. 
Tell us about William Call and his work on essence and existence and matter, because you're one of the few people who have written about his work. He was a younger philosopher at that time, and I was the editor then, found an editor of the International Philosophical Quarterly, and he got uh, caught profoundly in the uh, existential Thomism of Gilson. He studied up at Toronto, I believe, and got caught very strongly in that. And um, the other, the main influence on him was then Gerald Phelan, up at the uh, up at the Medieval Institute of Toronto, who really went very far in the existential Thomism, and said the language of essence um, really doesn't fit Thomism. It's an older language, uh, as though the essence, essence and existence, essence is some big solid kind of a thing with its own uh, density, and then it's put over into existence by the act of existence, but it's got its own um, sort of positivity, which then is just actualized by existence. And uh, uh, Phelan had said, that's not it at all. That language doesn't fit. So um, there's just the, just the act of existence, which then gets limited down, just so it's a much more um, streamlined and all out um, following out of the notion that that the act of existence is the source, uh, and the, it's the source and center of all the perfection in, in a being. Essence is just a limitation. So um, Phelan saw that very clearly and gave his famous talk in the American Catholic Philosophical, um, putting that forward, that essence was really, that's older language, it really doesn't fit the Thomism and made his astonishing statements that um, uh, God is Father Phelan, but Father Phelan is not God. That extraordinary paradoxical that caused a lot of trouble there because uh, God is the fullness of existence and all I am is a limited. So God is all that I am and much more, but I'm not what God is. So that extraordinary statement, and then I was one of the commentators on Phelan's speech, so Carlo and myself, so we got together then and um, I was much intrigued by Phelan's very dramatic uh, kind of presentation of that radical existentialism. And then, we, and then Bill Carlo wrote the article which we published for the International Philosophical Quarterly on that. So he was following it all the way, streamlining the thing. There's just the act of existence and limited act of existence. Now I felt that he was going um, a bit far uh, when he, he, he said, essence as limit is just like um, where in a frozen water, it's where the ice stops. There's no kind of, a, of an extra thing that limits it. It's just, just where the thing stops, where it stops. It's all ice, it's all the existence, and it just stops at a certain point. So uh, it's a completely negative kind of a thing. Um, I was a little worried that that was not giving enough role to essence, but still it seemed to me basically that any finite being was a limited act of existence. And uh, the whole core of positivity was the existence. Um, that was a real insight that I used, but um, it got in trouble. It got in trouble with various Thomas. I know John Whipple and Joseph Owens, all those, they were worried about playing down the role of essence. Said, no, we have to keep it more as a subject, otherwise you're liable to lose potency and various things. So I was a little ambivalent in that, but I did write the introduction to his book when he turned his article into a book and uh, basically going along with it. But uh, since I'm a little more, uh, little more reluctant, a little more uh, cautious about doing that for reasons of potency and so on. But um, then the other dramatic application was that once we're taking that any limitation is just purely negative restriction, is just existence and then limited existence. So he interpreted even matter, which is a lower degree of limitation in St. Thomas, even that as just a negation of existence where the ice stops, so to speak. So matter was not some whole new kind of being added on, but, but it was simply the dispersion 
an imperfection of existence. When it gets dispersed, can no longer hold together that much and gets dispersed over space. So matter would be a purely negative limitation on form and, and existence, purely negative. Now that was um, you know, really something new. The whole material world then becomes just a kind of negation of the um, fullness even of formal existence being together all at once. So that was a very dramatic thing, and I'm afraid that Thomists have not gone along with that. They've been very worried about that, and um, I'm a little concerned about that, that it, um, uh, the uh, new level of material being, that kind of limitation, allows all kinds of, of new creative expressions of being, which um, didn't seem to be just negative. So I'm cautious on going that far. I know you want, you, you go along with, with, uh, with him uh, more strongly there. So I'm certainly open to that. But Thomas, the uh, traditional and very good Thomas, have not been willing to go along. They're reluctant at playing down the essence as subject and so on. So I'm still ambivalent on that. But he had the courage to go follow an insight all the way to the radical, uh, radical uh, uh, implications of it the way Phelan did, which was wonderful. I thought it was, I love that streamlining. But it's just got me, made me a bit cautious, the reactions of others to it. Do you think you'll do more work on the question of matter? No, I don't. The, uh, the atmosphere is not, that's a very technical kind of thing. And um, um, uh, uh, the uh, traditional people have come out rather strongly and um, that we, sh we shouldn't go this way. And um, to do that, I'd have to do a lot more work on the text. St. Thomas is certainly ambivalent in his text. Many texts go for the stronger view of essence and some don't. I don't. Uh, I think there are other more important battles to fight. Uh, it would be interesting to follow that out. I did it in a European conference for the anniversary of St. Thomas, 1974, a brief one on um, essence as limit of existence, but it didn't get much uh, publicity over here. So I don't. There, there are too many other really fruitful and rich things that I'd like to write on at present, rather than that sort of technical one, which um, wouldn't uh, have as much uh, implications for spiritual life and so on. Like one of the things that people have been begging me to write on, younger Thomas, I said, why don't you write on? Well, they say, but well, you're well known, you could do it, was um, this doctrine in the natural theology of um, what used to be called Molinism, the uh, knowledge God's knowledge, so-called, of the futurables, middle knowledge, where God would have to know all that you would have done, whatever you would have done if you had been put in this circumstance, and you may never be put in that, or that you would have done had God uh, cre created the world this way or allowed this to happen, all the things that you would have done, what would have happened. And then uh, God to say, no, we don't want that world. But that kind of knowledge of God, which um, was held by the Jesuits, Molinism, against the Dominican Baniers because of his tendency towards too much predetermination. Um, it was a brilliant logical, but a good Thomistic metaphysician, existential Thomist, would look on that middle knowledge as a metaphysical monster. And it's coming back again through Alvin Plantiga, the um, Calvinist uh, um, theologian philosopher being picked up by Catholics again, Notre Dame, so-called middle knowledge. And I think it's a metaphysical monster and a serious misunderstanding for the simple reason that what you're asking is that God would see what a non-existent will, a decision that a non-existent will would make. But a decision is an existential something. A non-existent will can't make any decisions. So that was, you know, that if it's he said, well, it's true that, that you would have done this, therefore God must know it. St. Thomas would say there's no truth yet unless there's being to support it. So I think that's a real metaphysical monster, and it's coming back again as being a brilliant solution to various. I don't think it's a solution at all. So I'd like to write on that, risking losing some friends among um, 
certainly Alvin Plantinga and the Notre Dame, uh, even some of the Catholic philosophers there are reprinting Molina's book and all that, and I think it's a, we used to have to teach that as Jesuits. I refused to do it when I was put in. And then I discovered that Gregorian University, with all the Jesuit Thomas there, had quietly put that um, uh, knowledge of the future bulls, had quietly put that on the shelf as an historical thesis, no longer systematic. Mm -hmm. So I was supported then, but I refused to teach it because it's no good Thomas could possibly hold that theory, it seems to me, an existential Thomas. So I'd like to write on that because that's making a difference around. Tell us about the work you did on a creative retrieval of an existential sense of the existence of God. Well, that was um, un under the stimulus of scientists. I had to deliver that before scientists, and they were pushing me very hard. I've never been so challenged. And um, um, that's when that sudden suddenly occurred to me. Uh, like, you couldn't speak with the, the scientists about essence. Essence is a black box for them. They didn't uh, know what was in there. Well, I said, what kind of terms do you use? Well, they said models. So using that term model, it suddenly occurred, and occurred to them. And then Stephen Hawking, in his book, had it that, suppose you did get a theory of everything, the TOE, a theory of everything, where you, everything is explained physically by a simple thing there. You got that. This, you got this perfect model of everything. He said, would this model somehow bring itself into instantiation? with real energy? Would it somehow will itself to become real? Perfect model, but how about the, the real world? How to get that, uh, would it somehow will itself into existence? What does that mean? Or do you need something else? That um, suddenly hit me and I presented that to them. Suppose you got the perfect model. How about getting the instantiation with energy? Real energy, the model is a model for the transformations of energy, but the model has no energy. That, that suddenly hit me, and it hit the scientists too. Suppose you got the perfect model. Does that mean there are many other models that could be? How about the real instantiation? Even if you... If, if, um, um, uh, some scientists who sort of nutty, I think, uh, said that, if you could show that really there was only one possible universe, that's all, that there was oh, no, that one possible physical universe, it dispense with, with any kind of God or author or, or mind at all, it dispense with that. But that's totally to miss it, even if there was just one possible. It doesn't give you the slightest reason. How did that possibility become genuinely real with active energy? Just because it's possible, there's a huge gap between that and the real, and that did impress the scientists. And Hawking, amazingly, said, how about the model? You know, is it going to will itself into instantiation? He sort of got it for a moment. He lost the philosophical perspective a little bit later in that book, but still. Tell us about your work on person and cosmos. That's a somewhat new development that I've been going into just the last few years. <clears throat> I've been getting into that what is called the new dialogue between theology and science. And by theology, they really mean f philosophical theology. It's not the strict story, the re special revealed dogmas. So that, that's a new dialogue we're going on, a very fruitful one, quite different from the old dialogue, was uh, theology uh, keeping science at a distance. Science is a threat and all that, keeping that at a distance, keeping its own turf. Uh, but theology, um, back in the 16th century, after the new science became strong, theology washed its hands of science and just to, to follow its own path, and it did its own. And that was not the way St. Thomas uh, did it at all. So the new dialogue is a, what we can positively learn from science, learn about God, the meaning of the universe. It's a whole new positive dialogue. And the Pope, in, a, in his dramatic um, letter, um, which was the preface to that book you were talking about, has said that theology now must, um, really to be fruitful, must learn from science and uh, incorporate its findings into it positively. That's a whole new positive dialogue, especially about the evolutionary universe. It's not the old fight about whether or not God is needed along the way to get, to get the... Uh, uh, it's 
not about those partial ones. It's about a single great story of the universe, single great story from the Big Bang on, and with the um, human being, however it happened, emerging out of this long story as the final crown of this long story of development and being now uh, the, uh, so the divine creativity, not a fixed universe, but a tremendously creative universe that grows and grows and grows. And the, now God puts the, the sources of creativity um, participated right down into the process in human beings. So we are now new creative centers in this whole long story. And now we become created co-creators with God of a not yet finished universe. We're a powerful new creativity that's blossomed out in technology and all kinds of things where now we have become responsible for our own earth. And if we're not uh, truly responsible, we can ruin our own earth. But this, uh, that, that, that we are the cutting edge of creativity now in this long process of the universe. And uh, it's a single great story now. And we have this new role of, of um, being responsible for our part of the universe and maybe for more of it later on. Um, and partly responsible too, in the sense that um, it's in us, as some of the scientists say, in us that the atoms become self-conscious. Only in us does the whole unconscious material universe reach consciousness, come to the light. And as some say, that's the whole purpose of it all, to come into the light in our consciousness. We are the fulfillment of the material universe. And our role in it then, in a full vision, is then to gather up the material universe into consciousness and offer it back to God. The universe doesn't know it's on a journey. But we do, we can and we should, to recognize it as on a journey coming out from God and now trying to get back to God. And it goes back to God through us, where we can um, offer it back to God in recognition, where it comes from, in gratitude and worship. So we can complete the uh, story of the material universe by gathering it up into consciousness. And we're in the middle of it. It's part of us. The angels can't do that. They're not part of the material universe, but we can do it. So we have a role in the universe, very positive role, the new creativity in it, to gather up the universe, offer it back to God, and so fulfill the um, deepest uh, longing, so to speak, or the finality of the universe by bringing it into the light of consciousness. And scientists have said that uh, the atoms have been waiting to become conscious in us. And that's a kind of, the only, the highest value, the only uh, real value is for consciousness. A totally unconscious universe is a complete waste of time. So it's, it only has value when it comes into consciousness, can be appreciated. And that's our role in the universe. All of science comes in there to, for us to uh, rediscover the divine thoughts, the divine creative thoughts, rediscover them and rethink what God first thought and then creatively carry it on. That's a whole positive role of man in the universe, but it requires now that you, that you know the new science and learn positively from the new science. That's a whole new phase of positive relationship of philosophy and philosophy of God and theology with science, a positive relationship. The old fights about reductionism still have to go on, sure, but this is a much richer new positive picture that I think is very, Interesting, um, Protestants got into it first, and the Anglicans, there are a number of Anglican priests over in England who've become philosophers and theologians, and they're doing uh, but now the main work. But Catholics have now gotten into that. Father Christopher Mooney with his new book, um, Theology and the, um, Natural Science, I think it's called, is deliberately doing that, a fine book. So it's a new dialogue now, and I think we should get into it.